Hello, everyone. I'm going to first apologize for my voice. I lost it two days ago, so I was feeling pretty powerless about that. Um, so just bear with me, and um, I'll, uh, I'll try to speak as loud as possible. Uh, nearly nine years ago, I sat down to watch an Oprah special highlighting the lives of African AIDS orphans. It changed my life. The images on the television screen shook my then fifth grade reality. I saw children walking miles and miles without shoes, hand in hand with their siblings, presumably the only family they had left, smiling from ear to ear. And I thought, where were their parents? Why didn't they have shoes? And if they didn't have shoes or parents, why were they still smiling? These unanswered questions bothered me. And as I sat and watched the, the story of 13-year-old Candy Sile unfold, I began to imagine myself, 11-year-old Kendall Seesmeyer, living alone in a mud hut, taking care of my younger brothers and sisters, and grieving the death of my parents. I need to grab the clicker, sorry about that. Awesome. Powerless, see, it works, right? <laughs> and it was only you know, having experienced pain in my own life, Candy Stiles' pain resonated with me. But I was in awe of what appeared to be here in wavering hope. Now it was only six months later that I found myself in the ICU, connected to 25 tubes that literally connected me to life. Now, for those of you who aren't as familiar with the ICU, the intensive care unit, it's a place where day meets night, life meets death, and hope is really all you have. Enduring two liver transplants are by far the hardest challenges I've had to face. Yet, they are challenges that ironically have led me to walk hand in hand with the children that I saw on the television screen that day. When I was only eight weeks old, I was diagnosed with biliary atresia, a rare liver disease that plagued my life with illness, surgery, and uncertainty. During the first year of my life, I saw 12 different specialists for a variety of medical conditions. But unlike the common cough or cold that I'm suffering today, the sickness that was present in my body would not just subdue with a little Advil or triaminic. Growing up with a chronic illness threatened my normal childhood. I went to more doctor's appointments, I left school early for therapy, and I couldn't produce enough muscle to go across the monkey bars. A small task, but it really meant a lot to me at that age. I sought to keep my medical condition hidden. I was embarrassed by the scars across my abnormally large belly. I sought to define myself by something other than my illness, to turn my obstacle into an opportunity for someone else. That opportunity came after I seen the Oprah show, and I knew that I had the opportunity to redefine myself by something bigger than my, my circumstance. It was my power to live beyond that. So after I'd seen those children um, in Africa suffering from AIDS, I literally, I went upstairs to my bedroom and I did what we all do when we don't know what to do. I Googled it. I Googled AIDS orphans in Africa, and I found World Vision. They run an orphan sponsorship program, and online I found Benit, an eight-year-old girl from Mauritania who needed my help. So I thought, okay, all right, I'm gonna do this. I reached into my dresser drawer. I grabbed $360 of my saved up birthday and Christmas money. I stuffed it in an envelope, put a stamp on it, and sent it off to Benit. And months later, I got a letter back from Benit. She wrote how she was doing so well. She was in school for the first time, learning how to read and add and write. I couldn't imagine the change that I had made in this one little girl's life, that you know, I, as an 11-year-old girl, helping another eight-year-old girl. It was just unfathomable to, unfathomable to me. And I was hooked. I knew that I wanted to do more, and I knew with a little help, I could do just that. So six months later, that summer, I underwent two liver transplants. And 
my dad donated half of his liver in order to save my life. But unfortunately, due to a life-threatening aneurysm, I needed a second transplant only weeks later. During this time, I asked that friends and family donate to the cause I wanted to support. And with their help and the help of World Vision, I sponsored the community of Musele, Zambia, one of the most highly affected areas by the AIDS epidemic at the time. By the end of the summer, I had raised $15,000 as, get this, Kids from across the country, hearing of my effort, decided to do fundraisers as diverse as lemonade stands and penny wars. As a result of this snowball effect, I decided that I wanted to officially organize my effort, calling it Kids Caring for Kids. I thought that we could be kids caring for kids in Africa who would then be caring for their younger siblings and their friends as well. And in January of 2005, Kids Caring for Kids became a 501c3 not-for-profit organization. We worked to empower young people across the country to help provide basic human needs to children living in sub-Saharan Africa, especially those suffering um, as AIDS orphans. Since then, since our founding, we've been able to, whoops, We've been able to support eight projects in four countries in Africa. We've built an orphan care center, a community center, and a dormitory or for orphan girls. We've provided over 400 specially built bikes, indoor plumbing, healthy meals, and water wells. Isn't that incredible? It's incredible to me. Oh, thank you. <laughs> It's incredible to me that my one heart action grew into something that I would have never imagined or predicted. My intent was to give, to help, to make a difference. And while that has happened, the surprise has been that I've gotten back so much more than I've given. And I know that sounds cliche, so just hear me out. You're probably expecting for me to you know, talk about these kinds of things is the best things I could get out of service. Exhibit A, President Clinton coming to my high school, dragging me out of my high school gym to be with him on the Oprah show to meet the woman with the show who inspired it all. I tried not to cry. Or Exhibit B, a canoodling of sorts with Bono, wearing his sunglasses. <laughs> Note, I was only wearing his sunglasses because I was crying. <laughs> But, and sure, I've met people and I've been places, and I've had amazing opportunities that I never would have imagined. But what is far, far, far more significant in my life was this moment. Coming face to face with one of the little girls that we've helped through Kids Caring for Kids. Isn't she beautiful? I lose myself, and I lose my still own very challenging and uncertain circumstances and my love for her. Loving these kids has provided me with a sense of purpose beyond my circumstances. This is what saved me, and this is what kept me going. I knew I had more work to do and more love to give. Now, Bono said something about the concept of currency, and it really stuck with me. Bono claims that his strong voice and advocacy and philanthropy is simply in exchange of his rock star currency. Essentially, it's an exchange of his power and his platform for real change. And service has allowed me to redefine my purpose, to cash in my sympathy currency in exchange for something much greater. I didn't have to live with the label of Kendall the sick girl, but instead, Kendall the girl who wanted to help others. By far the most important thing that I've gotten from service is the ability to find my power in powerlessness. This is a picture of a mountain. That's pretty clear, right? But what is unclear and what is uncertain are what your mountains, your struggles will be. 
And note, I didn't say mountain, I said mountains. Struggles are inevitable. I can promise you that. I can promise you that if you haven't had one of these moments, that there will be moments in your life where your world feels like it's crashing down before your eyes, and all you really want to do is go crawl into your dog's crate. But what I know from experience is that you can find your power and powerlessness through service. Now, this isn't an earth-shattering concept, and it's very simple in its principle. Service can be anyone's power. It can be anyone's purpose. And what I love about service is that there are no barriers to entry in service. You don't have to earn a six-figure salary or even own a car. You don't have to make the football team or get an A in Arabic class, which I know is pretty hard at Georgetown. <laughs> service can be accessible to anyone. It can be anyone's power. Service can be your power and your weakness for others. You can be powerful for others by simply mowing your neighbor's lawn without request. You can be powerful for others by acknowledging those in your daily routine that you simply ignore. You can be powerful for others by opening your heart and your mind to the needs and desires of the world, be it in a very small or large way. Service can be your power and powerlessness. I'm grateful for the role that service has played in my life, as it has given me a purpose to live and to live beyond myself. Thank you. <laughs>